Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Zabo with the Office of Alumni and Parent Engagement at Furman University. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are thrilled to have Dan Cockrell, who is the former VP of the Magic Kingdom, one of the happiest places on earth with us today. Um, want to give a special shout out to Amy Giles with Out of the Box Designs who introduced us to Dan. Um, I was catching up with Dan a little bit before the event and you guys are in for a real treat today. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our guest speaker. Um, as I said, Dan is the former VP of the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World, Florida. He attended Boston University and graduated in 1991, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science. Um, after graduating from Boston University, Dan moved to Florida and worked as a parking attendant at Disney's Epcot Center. And then he joined Disneyland Paris Management Trainee Program as part of the opening team and moved to France in 1992. Dan was in France for five years before he relocated to Florida and held a number of executive roles at Walt Disney World Resort, both in theme parks and resort hotels. His last nine years with the company, he was successively vice president of Epcot, Magic Kingdom, and Disney's Hollywood Studios. And then eventually he ended up as the vice president of the Magic Kingdom where he led 12,000 cast members and entertained over 20 million guests annually. So very impressive bio for Mr. Dan Cockrell. So um, without further ado, Dan, I'm going to turn the show over to you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, before I get going, Sarah, can you, you give me a quick thumbs up? You can hear me. Can hear you loud and clear. Okay. I have this uh, nightmare that I'm going to do a whole webinar for an hour and my microphone's not going to be on. And it, I wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. So thank you for, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Sarah. And uh, thank you all the uh, Furman uh, alumni uh, and uh, and uh, professors and staff, um, really appreciate you being here today. Uh, and um, she had mentioned Amy Giles. You know, Amy and I, I mentioned to Sarah that technology now is incredible because uh, Amy and I haven't met, but uh, we, we, we've been working together. And she talked to Sarah and said, hey, I know a guy named Dan, and he'd, be, he'd love to talk to your, uh, your alumni and do some speeches there. And so we got this organized. And, uh, you know, we always start out with, um, well, what are you going to talk about? And every, uh, every uh, talk I do, there's a lot of uh, very similar themes. There's not a whole bunch of new concepts, but I like to um, open it up a little bit. So, you know, I was thinking about this idea of uh, sustaining success personally and professionally. Um, I think, you know, the past year, uh, people have been doing a lot of thinking about um, a lot of things. And I know a lot of people are at a crossroads right now trying to figure out what they want to do. Um, it's these kind of um, these moments, these crises that make people think differently. And so I thought this was, would be something good to tackle, uh, uh, sharing some experiences. Um, and as uh, Sarah mentioned, you know, I had the opportunity to work in an incredible company for a long time and really learned uh, how to run a business and how to um, had great role models. And so today I want to share some of that with you. Now, a couple things uh, I want to mention to you. First of all, there is a Q&A function uh, or a chat function. However you want to do it, send questions. Uh, during the, the session here. If you have anything you'd like to know, we are going to uh, entertain questions at the end. Uh, hopefully, we'll have about 15, 20 minutes. And I'd like, that's my favorite part of the whole webinar is just open-ended questions and let's talk and I'll tell you everything I know. And as I tell people, I'm not at Disney anymore, so I can talk about whatever I want, but I'm, I'll, I'll make sure I respect the confidentiality of things that go on there. Um, and uh, yeah, I've made a big life transition. The past... Um, Three years, I now I went from uh, leading 12,000 uh, employees to now my wife and I'm the dog, and that's our whole company. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And uh, the last thing I want to mention, you're going to get a follow-up email from uh, Sarah and Furman, and it's going to have a link, and it's going to have everything I'm showing you today. You're going to get a PDF document. You're going to get a PDF document of all the stuff I'm showing you, all the models I'm showing you, the quotes I'm going to show you, and of course, all the information to get in touch with Valerie and I. So if you ever want to uh, either buy our book or hire us in the future, you know exactly where to find us. But uh, don't, you know, you can take some notes today. But like I said, we'll give this all to you. So if you'd like to share it with others, um, that'd be fine. Um, so I did. I started in the parking lot at Epcot in 1991. I uh, went to Boston University, studied political science, had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. So um, I'd spent a, a, a summer in college working at Disney. 
uh, at our peak, we had about 12,000 college students working at Walt Disney World. And it's a great experience for the students. It's a great experience for Disney. And it's great to have on your resume. So I did that for a summer. And when I graduated from BU, I still didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I decided to go back to Disney. And I got there and they said, well, okay, what do you want to do? I said, well, look, I got a political science degree. What am I qualified to do? They said, you should park cars at Epcot. And so that's what I did. And so uh, this is the days before the digital photo. And interestingly, we still have the same yellow shorts and uh, yellow and white striped uh, sweatshirts out in the parking lot. That hasn't changed in, uh, in uh, 30 years. Um, and then eventually made my way um, through 19 different jobs with the company. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I worked in France for five years. Uh, my wife and I uh, met in the United States working for Disney, but she's from France. And I, I mentioned we had an eight-week engagement uh, back in 1993, and we got married quickly so I could stay over there and keep working. And our, uh, our son was born over there, and our two other kids were born in Florida. And uh, um, I just had a great run. And so today, one of the themes uh, I think you're going to hear heavily that I work into things is about diverse experience. Um, you know, 26 years at Disney, 19 different jobs was uh, I learned so much along the way. And I just, I really tell students today, even adults, um, lear keep learning. There's so many things to learn. There's so many things to see. And I think we've sort of um, forgotten how incredible the internet is and how incredible technology is. Everything that we want to know is at our fingertips. And uh, I'm just, I have a big passion for trying to reignite that curiosity in people. Um, I was a 2.5 GPA student, and it's a miracle I graduated from college. And, uh, you know, later in life, I realized how incredible learning and education is. And so I, uh, I always talk about get exposed to new experiences, get um, meet new people. All this adds up not only to a great career, but it'll add up to, um, you know, a, a really interesting life. And I think that's why we're all here. Um, also, my wife and I wrote a, a book. It came out of August of last year called How's the Culture in Your Kingdom? And uh, when I left, I really wanted to get on the paper kind of what I did at Disney and how we think about things. And so that's available on Amazon. Uh, there's an ebook, there's the paperback, and there's also an audio book that my uh, uh, partner that I do my podcast with, Jody Mayberry, I did all the audio for that. Um, and a lot of the themes you're going to hear today come, come out of this book. So I wanted to use today models. I love models. And over time, I've, I've, I've used, I've learned a lot of uh, different models to apply to figure out um, how to organize my life, how to organize myself at work, how to organize my relationship with my family. And so I'm going to be talking about a lot of leadership and management and personal uh, leadership examples today. But I want to use this idea of models because they're very helpful. Because when you have a methodology to apply to your life, um, it helps you problem solve. And then obviously you can use your emotions, you can use your common sense. But uh, the first one I wanted to share today is from successes. And I think we all, as we get older, we realize this, this is what we think our life and career is going to look like. And then reality sets in and we can't even imagine um, what's going to happen after that. And this is why life is so interesting and so great. And it's so fun because uh, we get thrown lots of different things at us. And I think today, maybe we put in uh, maybe students' minds that they're supposed to know what their life plan is or what their goal is. And, uh, you know, they may have areas of expertise or mastery, but uh, the, the world is, so there's so many opportunities today. I don't think you can do that. So I think this is a good one that uh, students and maybe younger people should see and realize that the road ahead is going to be um, pretty dynamic. So I looked up the uh, definition of success um, in the dictionary and, uh, came out with a few things here, which were interesting. Uh, the degree of, of or measure of succeeding. Okay, that's a good definition. A favorable or desired outcome. That's a good one too. The, the, this one is interesting. The attainment of wealth, favor, or eminence. And uh, when, I, when you talk to people and you go online, you read any article about success, it never talks about money. It never talks about uh, getting things or becoming important or getting uh, monetary things. But I think a lot of us, that's how we weigh success in life is uh, what did you do? What was your title? Uh, what, you know, how many people did you lead? And so um, I, uh, when I left Disney, you know, Valerie asked me, we talked about it for about a year because I didn't think I could ever leave, but we, we discussed it and our kids were growing up and in college. And we discussed this idea of, uh, she said, do you, are you sure you can leave Disney? And I said, well, I don't know. Cause I, you know, I, I got to figure out how to communicate with the real world. She said, no, I mean, your ego, 
are you going to be okay to not be in the role you're in with the title you have and the, the influence you have? And it was a great question. And my, my dad was always very big on talking about how your family is really the only thing, if you're lucky, that you're always going to have with you. And uh, jobs come and go and job titles come and go and money comes and goes. But uh, those long term relationships, long term things you do in your life stay with you. And uh, when I left Disney on May 11th, 2018, I kind of joke that I woke up the next morning, opened up the Orlando Sentinel, and I was just waiting for the headline that the Magic Kingdom didn't open because I had left. And magically, somehow it opened and it opened every day after that. And I know they closed for a while for the pandemic, but um, um, things come and go. And so the way I, I like to think about it, success is we define what success is. And I'm going to talk more about that. But today, social media puts so many unrealistic pressures and expectations on people. Uh, you all know the FOMO, fear of missing out, uh, FOBO, fear of a better offer. Um, we get to see everyone's best moments online. And we somehow tell ourselves, why can't I have a life behind that? But the reality is outside the frames of that photo, people are having medical issues and they're having depression and they're having, trying to figure out how to get along with their spouse and they're getting, you know, they're having issues with their kids. They have, everyone has problems, but uh, you know, in society, we don't talk about it. We don't show that. And we put our best stuff on social media. So I think we're, we have to be careful about how we define success. Um, I love quotes and you can find all kinds of quotes online. One of the ones I use often was Winston Churchill and how he defines success. Um, and as you say, success is walking from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. And, uh, um, you know, at 51 years old now, um, I've had many failures and many times when I made really bad decisions and uh, had to recover from them. And uh, you got to get up every day and get on with it. And uh, you're going to make mistakes along the way. Um, another great one, uh, not necessarily with success, but uh, Mike, Michael Tyson, Mike Tyson has a great quote, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> and then they really figure out what they're made of. Um, so it's uh, this idea of how do you just um, long term, how do you get through life and just keep figuring out what you want? And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that today. So here's my definition of success. And I'm not going to define it. But here's how I think about it. First of all, you define it, and you judge it. And that should be how it is. Um, uh, people's parents shouldn't, shouldn't judge their, their kids' success. Kids shouldn't judge other people's success. Uh, Instagram and Facebook and anything online should not judge what success is, although it does. We define what success is going to be for us, and then we, we decide if we've been successful or not, because only we know how much we can do. Only we know how much we can get done. Only we know our potential. And, uh, and the potential has nothing to do with uh, looking at, your, at the person next to you. And a lot of times we get caught up in that. And I get caught up in that less today, but I still get caught up in those moments saying, wow, I wish I could be more like that well, wait a second, Dan, you have a plan for your life. You're doing what you love doing. So why would you even worry about that? So um, run your own race is what I always tell myself. Run your own race. Um, I've never done a marathon, but my wife and I have done a bunch of half marathons and 5Ks. And, you know, we go out and do the turkey trot. And um, invariably, when I was younger, I'd be running, running my pace. I know how fast I can run. I know what my best time is. And then some stranger would run by me. And I would decide that I'm going to try to keep up with that person. It made no sense because that person, maybe they were 10 years younger than me. Maybe they had been training for running their whole life. Um, there's all these things. So the idea is run your own race, decide what you're going to be happy with and successful with, align that with yourself and you define what that is. So how do I think about that? Um, I've learned a, a while ago, this idea, I call them my buckets. And um, the reality is we all have 24 hours a day and we only have you know, the same amount of time to use. And so a lot of what we want to get done in life and what we want to spend our time has to do with our priorities. And I think that's where we get caught up a lot of times. We don't clearly know what our priorities are and we get pulled in lots of different directions and we end up spending time in areas that don't add value to our life or we're trying to help other people or trying to do other things that are not part of our plan, but we let distractions lead those to those moments. Um, I used to get calls every once in a while, you know, there'd be a headhunter would call a bunch of the VPs at Disney and say, Hey, we have a job in Asia or South America or somewhere in the United States. We're, we're looking for a, a chief operating officer. We'd all get the call. 
and we'd all get excited about it because, you know, at Disney, you don't get a lot of calls because they don't know who to call. And uh, a few times I'd get a call and I'd say, wow, this looks really neat. I'd call my dad because uh, he always gave me great advice. I said, hey, I got this possibility to go interview for this job. What do you think? And he said, the first thing we'd say was, if they didn't call you, would you have gone and looked for that job? I said, well, no, I'm really happy what I'm doing, but it's pretty cool. And it could be a lot of money and everything. He said, all right, well, if you really want to go do something like that, why don't you go out and get a headhunter yourself and find 10 jobs like that and take the best one instead of just reacting to that one person who's calling you. And then I'd say, well, actually, I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing. And then that would go away again. So once again, prioritization. So my three buckets, um, uh, I'm going to tell you, I, I prioritize these. So whenever I do speeches, I ask people, what do you think my number one priority in my life is? Um, so I'm going to let you answer at home or wherever you're calling from and think about that, or maybe say it out loud, what do you think my number one priority is? Now, most of you, I think said, well, Dan, it's your family. It's your parents. It's your wife. It's your kids, your family. That that's the number one priority you should have in your life because that's the only people only with you. And it's not my number one priority is myself. And uh, when we wrote, uh, Valor and I wrote the book, uh, How's the Culture in Your Kingdom, uh, we talked about that. And when the publisher read it, he said, look, I, I, I love the book and we're going to publish it, but I don't know if you should put this whole section about leading self first, because it feels a lot like a self-help book, not a leadership and management book. And uh, Valor and I talked about it and she said, well, Dan, if we let the publisher put lead self at the end of the book, we're going to do exactly what most people do in life. They put themselves last and they try to do everything else first. And the reality is, once you take care of yourself, you do everything else better. When you eat right, you get exercise, when you get enough sleep, um, when you have good relationships with people, when you're organized and have a good time management system, when you learn how to handle stress, when you feel confident about yourself, you're a better husband, a better wife, a better son, a better daughter, a better parent, a better boss, a better employee. Um, and you know, I grew up playing sports. And in sports, you always take care of yourself because you have to go compete. Uh, you know, I, it was not uh, reasonable to go to bed at two in the morning or go out the night before a football game or a rugby match because you're, you're doing a disservice to your team. But somehow we once we start working, we don't take care of ourselves the way we did maybe before when we were maybe doing sports or other things. So my number one bucket is self. And I when I was working at Disney, this is hard to work in because you have to get all these right. And so for me, look, focusing on self, the main thing was exercise. For me, if I could get exercise, that's how I dealt with stress. That's how I got my endorphins up. Um, and so I had to get up early because, you know, Disney opens early and I had to be there early and work long days and I had to get it done in the morning. So I'd get up early and go take a run or go take a swim. And if I could take care of myself, um, then I was successful that day. Uh, number two, family and number three, career. These were my three buckets. And this is how I thought about uh, myself every day. Did I, am I, am I, am I getting enough sleep? Um, you know, if you got to get up early and you want to get enough sleep, you got to go to bed early. And so we'd get to bed eight 30, nine o'clock. I was in bed because I was getting up at four 30, five o'clock the next morning to go work out. So I could get to work and get enough time in and be home for dinner. And so it's, um, you use, uh, you know, you're, you're using more hours in the day, but I prioritize these. So if I could get my exercise in as with my family, have you called your mom? Uh, did you take the trash out without being asked? You know, when it came to being married, married is 99%, uh, well, 1% romance and 99% pulling your weight, doing what you say you're going to do, uh, responding to your kids when they text you, uh, calling your mom, checking in with your spouse when you get in a fight, apologizing. Um, you know, how are you delivering on being a good parent or a good uh, husband? And then lastly, career. And we get measured all the time on how we do at our jobs, right? We get reports, we get feedback. Um, and we, we kind of get measured there. But these were my three buckets. And any given week, I could go through and figure out if I had done well. Some mornings, I had to go in early for a, a walkthrough of the park, and I didn't have time to work out. So I got a zero for self. Um, but I'd get a, a good, um, you know, maybe the career was good that day. Or maybe I had to stay late for work, and I couldn't go home and have dinner with my family. Um, I got a zero for family, but I was able to do my job that day. Some days, I'd leave work early and go to the kids' soccer match. All right, I delivered on family, but I didn't. So it's about prioritization and it's about um, um, sacrificing. And so I'm not going to tell you what your three buckets should be, 
but you should have some clarity in your mind. So you know where you should be spending your time and know when you're adding value and when you're not. And uh, it doesn't mean you're going to always be successful, but clarity is a beautiful thing. And so uh, this is the way I thought about it. So when I think about self, here's another model. And a lot of you do psychology, may be familiar with this or something called the Johari window. This was a big one for me in my life, not only um, being married, having kids, working, but the Johari window is all about um, self-awareness. And uh, there's um, like everything in life, you can put everything in four quadrants. So the Johari window looks at um, what others know about you and what others don't know about you and what you know about yourself and what you don't know about yourself. And so if you, if you look at each of these quadrants, what you know about yourself and what others know about you is called the arena. It's the things that people know. When you go to work, people, maybe you've told them where you're from. They know your name. They know you have kids. They know your backgrounds. As much as you shared with them is what they know. And that's public knowledge. And everyone knows that every culture is different in France. Um, people tell you much less about themselves because work is really separate from personal life. And that was something I had to adjust to because the United States, we tell everyone everything about us, but you know, some people are more closed on their personal life and some people are more open, but that's called the arena. Then you have what others don't know about you and what you know about yourself. And this is called the facade. We all have this. We all have things that we've not shared with our coworkers or people we work with. Uh, there are people suffering from depression or dealing with depression they, they haven't told anyone. They only maybe their family knows. Maybe their family doesn't even know. Um, they, they have, you know, maybe uh, uh, life aspirations they haven't shared with anyone. This is what you know about yourself. It's your personal secrets that you keep. And eventually when you build trust over time, you may share those with people, but that's yours. Then you have the whole what you don't know and what others don't know. And this is the unknown. It's your subconscious. You know, this is probably what you dream about. And you have these really strange dreams. That's probably going on here, but it's something down there. And the last one, what you don't know about yourself and what others um, uh, actually, okay, maybe I, I mixed that up. Sorry, I'll fix that. But anyway, it's what others know about you and you don't know about yourself. And that's called the blind spot. And basically the blind spot says, and this is where a lot of people um, uh, have mistakes in life because they don't know when they go to a restaurant, they're talking too loud. They don't realize at work, the way they're doing things, they're interrupting in meetings. Um, and they don't know it, and they're not willing to speak up and have other give them feedback. And we go through life with these blind spots. And it's up to us to figure out what these blind spots are. And so something I figured out, um, uh, well, first of all, I married a lady who tells me about my blind spots, we have, we have a pretty high feedback relationship, I don't always like to hear it. But it is the way we operate. And that's how we get better. And we have our moments. Uh, and when we, we started working together, we had to figure out a lot of things. We've been married successfully for 27 years, but we'd never worked together. And we had to figure out how to trust each other professionally. So um, this idea of self-awareness, um, and there's all kinds of great tools out there. Myers-Briggs, DISC, there's um, the uh, Strength Finders by Gallup. The more you can keep um, studying yourself and figuring out how you influence people, how you communicate, what your impact on others is, it's going to help you deal with relationships in life and it's going to help you get better. Because that idea of we don't know what we don't know, if we think we know everything, we're not going to have any curiosity to learn anything new. But if we assume there's a bunch of stuff we don't know, it's going to empower us to ask more questions and not make assumptions. The next one, which is uh, something that... Uh, I still have a little bit of this, but I've gotten much better. But when I was younger, this was um, terrible procrastination. Um, I was the master of putting things off. I was cramming for tests. And that's why I didn't do well in college. I didn't learn how to, as they say, how to eat an elephant one bite at a time. And so I think this is a great model that'll be in the PDF document we send you. Um, it's it's a, a graph of uh, on the on one axis is time, the other is pain. And, you know, when you get an assignment or you get a, a new job or you get a really complex thing you need to figure out, you start at the beginning of that and the pain level is medium because you don't have to have anything done yet. And as you get closer to the action line, the deadline, whatever you have to have something done, the pain level starts to go up dramatically and you have to cram all night or you get stressed about it or you're, you're always worrying about it or you feel bad about yourself because you're not taking care of things. And then once you get past that action line, um, and get it done, it goes back down again. So the idea is, can you flatten this curve? Can you actually start to put in um, and be ready when you hit the, the deadline for these things and be prepared? And we're going to talk a little bit about time management here. Um, the, um, the next one we have, um, um, 
I've, the, it didn't update. I put Johari window here. This is the Eisenhower matrix. And I'm going to come back to that in, in a little bit here. Um, emotional bank accounts. So um, if you've read a Stephen Covey, uh, Stephen Covey's book, um, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, um, he talks about emotional bank accounts. And uh, the concept here is that um, every day we are doing something for people or they're doing something for us. I mentioned earlier, take out the trash. Um, uh, call your call your spouse and let them know you're running late. Uh, go ahead and if you need someone to work overtime at work, go ahead and ask them. If they agree with you to do that, they've you've they've made a deposit in your emotional bank account. And now you owe them. And there's an exchange constantly ha happening with emotional bank accounts. And so I've learned over time, you ha when you have an opportunity, you have to constantly making deposits to build trust with people. And once again, this is with family members. It's with employees. Uh, you need to find ways to make sure that you're showing that you care about them and you respect them. So examples of making these deposits, I'm seeking first to understand, you know, when uh, we go talk to our kids, why did you do this? You know, a lot of times, and I was that way, why did this happen? Well, if you'd ask first, hey, this happened, can you explain to me what happened? The approach is much different. So are you willing to seek first to understand and not make accusations? Showing kindness and courtesy and respect to people. Um, during the hurricanes at Disney, we count on uh, our employees coming back and early to get the parks back open again. And they only come back if we, we've kind of have really worked with them well during the easy times. So once again, when you're kind to people, you're courteous, you respect them, you're making these deposits into them. You keep your promises, set clear expectations, you apologize when you make a mistake, you give feedback to people and you forgive people. And this is how you build trust. Um, and then the withdrawals, times when you assume you understand, you're unkind, you break promises, you don't follow through, uh, your expectations are vague, you're arrogant, you give no feedback, you hold grudges. This is when those withdrawals happen. And so you just got to be thinking to yourself all the time. And I figured this out as a leader at Disney. I was one person at the Magic Kingdom of 12,000. The way my employees delivered uh, the service experience I was on the hook for that. If they didn't do their job well, I was in big trouble. And if I didn't create an environment for them where they were trained, they were respected, they were listened to, they had the right equipment to do their jobs, um, they weren't going to enjoy their job and they were in trouble. So, um, you know, when you work, it really is a symbiotic relationship. And so I would just ask you every day, what is it? What are these uh, things you can do for people? And what are the withdrawals you're making? And there's an exchange there. We all keep track of this. Uh, another great book, the seven, um, uh, the five uh, uh, love languages. Um, you can go ahead and get the book or look at the, the recap of that, but there's five love languages. And I had my wife take the quiz. Um, and at the end it says, well, okay, you like, you like, uh, uh, you like things, you like acts of kindness, uh, you like touch, you like uh, feedback. Um, and after she took the quiz, she said, well, uh, why do I have to choose? I want all of them. And I said, okay, I'll work on giving you all of them, but this just gives a priority what you want. But once again, the more you know what people, what motivates them and what builds trust, actions and behaviors build trust, and that creates these emotional bank accounts. Chain of excellence, another model that, um, and if, if, if for you, those of you running businesses, this model applies to Disney. This is the model we use to run Walt Disney World. And it's, I would say it's the model we use to run any company. It starts with sustainable results. Any company wants to get sustainable results. You want to have an output and outcome. Um, you want people, um, A, to come back again, and you want people to recommend your product. Th that was the holy grail of the Magic Kingdom. Every month, we looked at that score. How likely are, are you to strongly uh, agree that you're going to come back again? And how likely are you to strongly agree that you will recommend Walt Disney World as a, a vacation destination? And that applies to a pharmacy. It applies to a college. It applies to... Uh, the supermarket, giving people great experiences so they come back and they, they talk positively about you in person, online, it's free marketing. Well, in order to do that, you have to deliver client satisfaction. You need to provide excellent service and excellent service is defined on what, whatever your customers deem excellent is. And when you get to know them and understand empathetically their point of view, you'll start to learn what those things are. At Walt Disney World, we learned the secret to people coming back again and again was not the roller coasters and it wasn't Mickey Mouse and it wasn't the waffles and it wasn't the hotels. Those were all expected. When people paid to come to Walt Disney World, they said, look, we're going to give you our second mortgage to come to, to visit you. Now, those are all things we expect. 
But the only reason we're going to come back again and give you an excellent rating is make us feel special, treat us as individuals, respect us, and be knowledgeable. Know what you're talking about so we get the most out of our vacation. And so we focused on those four things. We have to run a great operation. We need to entertain people. We need to have great fireworks. We need to have great food. We need to make sure we have characters and rides and attractions. And that's hard enough. That only That's the price of admission. How you make people feel in your business is why they come back and why they talk about you in a positive way. And that's what client satisfaction was for Disney. Well, in order to deliver client satisfaction, your employees do that for you. They need to be satisfied. And so that comes back to leadership. And guess what our cast members told us, our employees told us at Disney, why they like working there. We expect to get paid. We expect to be trained. We expect to have the equipment to do our jobs. If you make us feel special, treat us as individuals, respect us as employees, and make us knowledgeable so we can do our jobs well, that's why we'll stay. So ironically, our employees want the same thing our guests want, is those four things. And so that's what I focused on. And that all starts with leadership. Leadership is responsible and accountable to create the right environment for their people, to make sure they're trained, to make sure there's clear values, that there's clarity, there's great relationships, there's clear expectations for performance, People are rewarded and recognized when they do a great job and they're coached and disciplined when they don't to, to maintain the, the, uh, the level of that experience. And uh, this, this is the model. So I would uh, uh, have you all think about this. And if you want to figure out how to get fix your businesses and make them better, think about how you're delivering in these four buckets, um, because that's where you deliver and you can't short circuit any of them. You can't just go make a lot of money without creating the environment first. And that's why a lot of companies don't do this because they don't have the patience and they don't look at the long, the long view of running their business, but sustainable companies to get results. It starts with leadership. It starts with values and it results in sustainable results. Uh, Radical candor. This is something, if you haven't read this book, another great book to read. Uh, Kim Scott is the author. She's former Facebook executive and she wrote Radical Candor. Another model that I used constantly um, when I was working at Disney and, and afterwards. And what she talked about um, when you're managing leading people um, or you're raising kids, there's a lot of similarities here. Uh, on one axis, you care personally. And the other axis, you challenge people directly. And if you can care for people personally and challenge them directly, you are going to be a great leader because a lot of times people uh, struggle to be both of these. If you uh, care personally about people, but you're not willing to challenge them, you're going to give them ruinous empathy. This is when, uh, think about this, your kid, you know, your son is supposed to be home at midnight and he gets home at 1230 and you tell him, well, it's okay, do better next time. That is the road to disaster. Though He'll be home at 1 a.m. next time. And we don't do that as parents. We talk about it right then and there. Look, I care about you personally and you better be home on time and you're grounded. And you challenge them directly so they can learn and they can be safe and they can learn the rules. So people who care, but don't challenge are, you know, they, they're, they're, they're afraid. They don't have the courage to let people know what they expect. Um, if you don't care about people, you don't challenge them. That's just manipulative. Not a great trait for a leader. Now there's other leaders challenge people directly, but don't care about them. We consider that obnoxious aggression and those people are out there. And at Disney, there's no room for these leaders. Uh, our leaders need to get results and be held accountable to how they get those results. And uh, lastly, it's called radical candor. When you can care people personally, build a relationship with them, get to know them on a personal level, get them to trust you. And then when they do a great job, you recognize them. And when you think they have room for improvement, you tell them directly. Um, and I've seen at Disney, I've seen a lot of big companies, uh, some leaders are afraid to do this. And not only are you doing a disservice for the people working for you, because they're not, they're not improving, you're not helping them with their blind spots. But in addition to that, um, you're not doing your job as a leader, because your job as a leader is to tell people when you have to say it, what you need to tell them to get things right, so you can deliver on that mission. So another great book. And then uh, the last model that I really liked, um, I found online was, you know, in life, this is our comfort zone. And this is where the magic happens. And a lot of times we're, we're looking for great results. We're looking for things to change, but we don't want to get out of our comfort zone. And I can tell you, leaving Disney after 26 years was the most terrifying thing I ever did. Um, and then after, you know, starting to get my business going, Valor and I got a, you know, we found out there's a, this pandemic and six months worth of business got canceled. We had to decide, are we going to, are we going to fold? Are we going to step up and have the right mindset and keep growing this and keep moving forward? And uh, we managed to do that. So 
Um, it's easy to get in a rut. It's easy to be comfortable in your, um, your uh, behaviors and your routines. Um, and I would just say, get additional experiences, move, learn more. And if need be, go get another job, start a new career. Um, this is the, the world is accelerating right now. And I think the people who are willing to go out and get out of their comfort zone regularly are going to be the ones that are going to be in control. Uh, before we go back, and I know there, there's probably been some, um, some messages I've seen pop up with some questions that Sarah is going to, uh, to, uh, to ask. Two quotes I want to leave with you. And once again, I'll put this on that PDF. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, some days you're the Louisville slugger and some days you're the ball. This was a, um, this was a quote by the bug by dire straits, great band. And um, um, if you listen to the lyrics of that song, this is absolutely true. Uh, as I tell people, there's some nights I drove back home from Disney, putting the music on blasting music, thinking to myself, there's never been a better vice president in the history of the Walt Disney company. I was fabulous today. I had all the right answers. I was funny. I was assertive. And then just literally the next day driving home with the radio off, thinking about how am I going to explain to my wife that I could get fired because I made such a stupid, dumb decision. So the reality is, and I found this not only working at Disney, but just in life, some days you're the Louisville slugger. Some days it's, you're, you're all over it. And some days you're just going to get knocked around. And the key is to know that that's going to be part of life and expect that every day is not going to be great. And then one quote by my, um, my grandfather, um, uh, Charles uh, Payne, he retired as a rear admiral in the Navy. He was a class of 42 at the Naval Academy. He served in World War II. Um, incredible, uh, incredible man. And he gave me this quote when I was little and I've kept it. He wrote it on a piece of paper for me. And his quote was, you do your best and then you forgive yourself. And everyone sees this quote differently. Um, but I, I love this. It's, you know, every day you get up and do your best. And sometimes, you know what? Your best isn't going to be good enough. Your best is going to be a failure. But you do what you can. You go home. You forgive yourself, you learn something and you get up the next day and you come in and you do your best again that day and you forgive yourself again and you don't carry around that guilt and you go out and that's how we improve in life. And uh, once again, run your own race, decide what your best is and then forgive yourself and keep moving forward. Um, this is uh, our website, cockerelconsulting.com. Uh, you can find everything that Valerie and I do, the book, the podcast, everything we, we work on and do and, uh, um, and, and check it out there. And that's it. So I think, uh, Sarah, we have about 20 minutes now for the Q&A, which, like I said, is my favorite part of this. So let's jump in and see what everyone has on their minds. All right. Thanks, Dan. Let's do this. We have a couple of questions that have already come in. Um, Great. So one question, what is the single best nugget of advice that you can give to a student applying to the Disney College program? Um, or maybe even broader, just knowing the climate that we are in, in this COVID-19 world, what is the best piece of advice that you might be willing to give to someone who is making a career change? Or we have some, I know we have some 2020 grads on this call or 2020 kids um, or folks who are trying to make that career change and get their foot in the door somewhere and maybe step outside of their comfort zone a little bit. Yeah. This for me is all about, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer a little broader, right fit talent. Um, well, and let me say this, first of all, right now, if I know people dream about the Walt Disney World College program and people are saying, look, if I can't do that, I'm just not, I'm not going to do anything. And I've told students, I said, look, it's a great program, but um, it's not happening right now. And other companies are out there. And if you want to be in service or, or operations or hospitality, there are a lot of great companies. And so, you know, keep an eye on Disney. And if you want to work for Disney someday, um, you can even go, you know, if you want uh, during the summer, go down and apply for a part-time job, move to Orlando, get a job um, um, and go ahead and see if you can get a part-time job at Disney, to get your foot in the door. But the college program is not the end all be all of everything. And I think some people get caught up in that. Um, my, the big thing I learned was um, uh, why I, why I stayed at Disney for 26 years is because um, I love helping people. I love working with people. I love service. I was the one where when I was younger, I, I helped out people. I would help the teacher at the end of the day, clean up the classroom. I was the one that kind of knew everybody. Um, and the irony is when you work in a, the service industry, you're serving every day. Not everyone should be working the service industry. 
Um, you know, it's, it's about right fit. So this is not about whether you're good or bad. It's about, are you going to be in a career? Are you going to be in an environment where you get to do what you do best every day? Um, if you're familiar with Strength Finders by Gallup, uh, Strength Finders 2.0 is the most recent. You know, I, I was, I went to, in 1998, I was, um, you know, working with Gallup to figure out what my strengths are. Four out of five of my strengths are really have to do with people and being with people. So what I figure, figured out at working at Disney is every moment I was by myself, working by myself, I was adding no value. I'm more creative when I interact with people. I have more energy. I'm more inspirational. Everything is better when I'm interacting with people. And so I learned over time, I have to be a job where I'm with people all the time. And that's a big reason I, I, I created an online community to talk to people all the time. I use technology all the time because that's how I kind of get things right. So one is, once again, use some of these tools out there to figure out what your predictive uh, talents are. What are the things you're naturally good at? Um, you know, this whole idea of nature versus nurture. I used to think anyone could be great at anything. And then my wife and I had three kids. And I'm like, forget that. 99% of what you can be great at is wired into you. And the rest is you're deciding to develop it. Um, you know, our, our son is an engineer and uh, I got no, I don't know, a shred of engineering in me. And our daughter, when she was uh, six years old, she wanted a filing cabinet for Christmas because she just loves organizing things. That's how she's wired. We didn't teach her that. Um, so I would say figure out your parents can help you um, talk to people, figure out not the job you want, but what are the situations you like to be in? Do you like problem solving? Do you like being in front of people and, and dealing with, uh, do you like a high paced environment? Do you like things to be um, um, predictable? You know, if, if you don't like uh, things to pop up and things to, things to happen, the theme park or the hospitality business is probably a terrible place to work. Um, so everyone is wired differently. And the good thing about it is when you're a student, you can't make any mistakes because I worked in jobs I hated, but I learned you know what? I shouldn't be doing that job. I was in human resources for a year. You know what? I shouldn't be working human resources. Cross that off. When I was in college, I worked for an investment bank. You know what? I didn't enjoy that. Cross that off the list. So the good news is um, you're going you're gonna to get into jobs that maybe you're not good at or you're not going to enjoy. But long term, those are all positive experiences because they help you realize. And once again, they create more self-awareness of where you're going to be able to thrive. Thanks, Dan. So this is a good segue um, to a great question that's come in from Claire. How much weight should we put into things like the Myers-Briggs assessment, Enneagram number, and other personal assessments when considering how we work and live? Yeah, you know, they're, they're all just tools, but they are tools that will help you be more self-aware. I keep coming back to that word. Um, I'm always careful because sometimes the Myers-Briggs, it'll tell you that you're this. And all of a sudden people are like, what are you? Well, I'm an ENFP. It's like, that's not who you are. Maybe that's uh, predictively how you lean. That's how you deal with things. But, you know, humans are much more complicated than that. So I think all those tools are great to have a good understanding of what you like to do, what, um, what situations you get in that you're great with dealing with what situations you get in that you're not good with dealing with and just be self-aware. And then what I found, you know, working at Disney was I stayed in operations the whole time because I loved operations because operations is a lot like sports. You have to work on a team. You have to spontaneously solve problems. There's a lot of pressure, no days the same. And that's kind of what any you know, sports game or match or is. Um, so I think that you should use those to help you understand um, the kinds of things you're good at, the kinds of things you're not good at, but don't let it define you because um, you can become very good at almost anything. You can't become excellent at anything. And that's the difference. Um, at Disney, we, you know, we, we measure everything on a five point scale, uh, poor, just okay, good, very good and excellent. And then we take very good and all the way down and we discard it. And we just say only excellent counts when it, cause when you have an excellent experience, the chances you're going to come back again are really high. When you have a very good experience, you may or may not come back again. So for us, very good is the same as poor, just okay, and good. And it's the same way from a career perspective. You can be very good at something, and there's a million other people who are very good at the same thing you're very good at. You got to figure out what's the thing you're excellent at. What are those? Where do you get to use your mastery, the things that you'd really just thrive on and find a job where you get to do that most of the time? 
And if you can do that, you're gonna be really happy and really successful um, and, and figuring that out. One other point, um, I've used those tools for team building. Uh, when I worked with a peer group or my team, I would get um, Myers-Briggs, I would get um, um, Gallup done, the strength finders. We started to learn how we worked with each other. So you know what, when the pressure's on, that person's going to st take a step back and think that person's going to step up and say what everyone's thinking, but doesn't want to say that person's going to look for a solution and get consensus. We all knew what everyone's role was because we understood the Myers Briggs and we understood the Gallup strength finder. And we knew what our role on the team was. A lot of people ignore that. And instead of just saying that person is high courage, they say that person's a jerk. Well, you know what, you need that person in certain moments, because you need someone to say what everyone else is not going to say. So once again, I think the more transparent you can be in sharing what what you are good at, not good at, but once again, just be careful to say I'm not going to do things because I, I can't do those. Uh, these are different. These are, these are levels of competencies. And um, once again, my, I just focus on excellent. What do I do? Excellent. And there's a bunch of things I don't do well. Now I have to hire people for graphic design, um, content um, creation. Valerie does that. She worked at Disney Institute for a while. She's great at that. So we all know what our, our role is. And I just try to spend as much time doing what I know is the best I can do. Okay, we have a lot of really great questions coming in. Um, Dan, tell us about what is a day in the life for you to maintain health, feed your curiosity and your marriage? Wow, that's a good one. So when I worked, so it, it varied when I worked at Disney. Um, yeah, I think our kids now are 25, 22, and 19. So the people today who are dealing with COVID and have little kids at home, I feel for you because I don't, I think <laughs> we had three kids. We probably have two by now because I just, I don't know how you handle that. Because, you know, for me going away to work and having that separation was a way to kind of deal with things. So I know a lot of you are dealing with that. But when I was at Disney, it was, my plan was get up early, get a run in, get home, um, and then have quiet time. Sometimes I would get, you know, leave and get halfway to work and stop at Starbucks and do an hour of emails so that when I got to work, I didn't have all this administrative stuff to do so I could be available for people. Um, the, um, um, and then, uh, you know, get, get what I had to do done at work. Um, I wanted to mention something that um, my slides, this will be on the recap, but um, there's something called the Eisenhower matrix. It's another model. Um, and it's things where there's things in life that are urgent and not urgent and things in life that are important and not important. So basically what the model says is things that are urgent and important are the things you're dealing with all the time, putting out fires. Hey, Dan, we just had a guest come in the park. He was carrying a gun. He doesn't have a permit. Hey, Dan, uh, Winnie the Pooh just tripped and fell and his head fell off. Uh, hey, Dan, we just had a complaint of a sexual harassment issue. Uh, hey, Dan, you know, there's a there's a tornado warning. These are, this is the, this is the nature of most of our businesses. And what I learned how to deal with that was under schedule. We all end up over scheduling our calendar because we want to get so many things done. And when we have to be out running our business, we get frustrated because people are interrupting us from our meetings. And what I learned at Disney was, you know what, let me, let me schedule less meetings. Let me be available to react to the emergencies I know are going to happen. I just don't know when they're going to happen. And now I'm being reasonable with my calendar and reasonable with myself. So Urgent, important was where I, I, I saved as much time as I could to be out there to react and support my team. Then the other really important box is um, important and not urgent. Um, this is exercising. If you're exercising, you're not going to have to deal with high blood pressure and a heart attack someday. If you are dealing with um, important and not urgent, you're reading your kids books every night when they're little so they get a love of reading so when they get to school they can keep up with the coursework. Um, if you're dealing with things that are important and not urgent, you're going to start saving, open an IRA account or a 401k account when you're 22 and not wait till you're 60, because these are urgent, not important things. They're the thing, they're the long-term things that we keep delaying and putting off. Um, and if you can start those things sooner, uh, you can do that. So that's how I, I thought about these things. Um, and I, you know, it's the same thing with marriage. Um, marriage is hard. And I, I underestimated how hard it would be to stop working. And then uh, my wife and I working together, it took us a full year and we still have our moments, but we've had to learn how to um, trust each other, how to um, be open to feedback from each other. Um, and it's a, uh, it's an ongoing thing. You're never done. Um, that's another concept I like to talk to people about is um, dilemmas and problems. Um, I used to deal with everything like a problem. Here's a problem and here's a solution. 
what I realized is that really important things in our life are not problems, they're dilemmas, because dilemmas have no solutions, they can only be managed, you can only manage your marriage, there is no solution, one day you're done, and you're like, okay, we're good now, we're never gonna have a fight again, we understand each other fully, it's never done, at work, you're never done, because there's always going to be new situations that come up, so the sooner you can take the things that are really complex, you think are problems, and call them dilemmas and realize you're never going to solve them, you're going to take a lot of pressure off yourself and you're going to live in that with some of that ambiguity that I think is, uh, is, is good to accept. Thanks, Dan. So you talked about um, earlier in the presentation, you talked about your buckets. Um, do you have any advice for others on how to keep up with those personal development opportunities and you know, self opportunities you talked about when you have a busy work schedule? Yeah. So I, I know I didn't answer that piece of the self-development piece. Um, yeah. You got to schedule time. You need to say, and this is where you just got to focus. You know what? Every Saturday um, I'm going to block one hour and I'm going to watch two Ted talks. That's all you start with. Or you know what? Every, um, every Monday morning, I'm going to block one hour on my calendar and I'm going to read three articles about how to be a better communicator. Um, or you, just, you block time out, which I, what I learned at Disney was I would block time out on my calendar to go walk the park. It would say walk the park and it would be an hour and a half, um, you know, three, four days a week. And it just said, go out and walk around the park. Cause I blocked it time. I, I didn't wait till I had extra time. Cause if I waited, I would never have extra time. So I would say whether it's spending more time with your kids or, or improving your relationship with your spouse, you know, date night, put it on your calendar, get it done. Um, don't have regrets. You know, we all wait for these things that aren't important, that are important, not urgent. And we keep putting them off because all these other things come. Those are important, urgent things are never going away. So if you really are serious about that, block off time. And I know you're going to say, well, once one hour a week is not enough to really make a dent in my self-development. Well, nothing is even less of a dent. So if you start to develop that behavior, that habit, slowly, you'll be able to build on it over time. Um, it's like, you know, if you want to lose a pound, you have to, uh, um, you know, burn 3,500 more calories than you take in. Most people want to do a diet and lose 10 pounds in two weeks. It doesn't happen that way. It happens that, you know what, I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose half a pound a week over six months. And people usually don't have the discipline to do that. So I would just tell you, start small and put it on your calendar and be disciplined to do it, no matter how small it is. If you want to get in shape and you're not even close, get up at 5 a.m., and go downstairs and have a cup of coffee. And then a few days later, get up at 5 a.m., go downstairs, have a cup of coffee, and get and put your running shorts on. And a few days later, go down and put your shoes on. And on the fifth day, go outside the door. And on the sixth day, go walk around the block. And once again, just do something. A lot of times we're all or nothing, and we're not willing to put these little incremental um, improvements in place to start developing habits. Um, and it's about, it's about, um, it's about the prioritization and trade-offs and sacrifice. That's what it is. You only have so many hours in the day. You have to decide what's really important and decide if you're going to put time in towards whatever goal you have. Thanks, Dan. I think that's great advice. I actually started doing the same thing, just blocking off an hour a week. And now I'm blocked off three hours a week for Sarah time. So it has yeah. definitely helped. So I uh, highly recommend that. Okay, we have... Just a couple minutes left, but um, I do want to ask this question because I think it's such a great one. How do we help those in our care or maybe those who are close to us get over rejection or failure? Yeah, it's uh, gosh, um, I think, well, you know, with our, I'll, I'll talk about close to us, our kids, right? Um, we raised three kids. Um, they, they were good kids. They had their moments. We had the moment where we got the call where, one of them was with their friends and they stole the road sign and they got caught by the police and their grandfather, our, my dad had to go pick them up. That was a low for us. We, we've had all these moments. And I just think as a parent, I've learned over time, and this is what my parents did. Um, you give unconditional love and you, um, you help people see the bigger picture. You give them context. Um, it, you know, working at Disney was interesting because the people who work at Disney, one of the things they have in common a lot of times is high responsibility. And that's one of the Gallup uh, strengths. People have high responsibility. It's personal to them. It's their word. It's their reputation. When they tell you they're going to do something, they're going to do it. And when you get to Disney, there's peer pressure. 
that you need to follow through because you're part of a team and you don't want to let anyone down on that team. And I learned that when I was parking cars, you don't want to be the weak, weak link that lets that one car park early. And then the whole thing, just cars are going everywhere. You want to deliver and, and deliver to the team. So what I learned over time was with our, with our kids is we are not going to tell you what to do. And my, my dad never told me what to do. He laid out the options and said, here's, here's some paths for you to take. And you decide what you want to do. Uh, he didn't tell me, I want you to be an executive. He didn't say, I want you to make a certain amount of money. He said, I want you to learn what you're going to do for in your life and figure out your path and be happy doing it. And um, you're going to have moments where things aren't going to go well. Um, and you, you know, your kids, you know, the people who are close to you. I generally would say, um, like our sons, <laughs> boys are different. Um, you know, we had to make sure that we're like, okay, you know how big a deal this was, right? This could be a big deal. This is not acceptable. You know, our daughter, all we had to say was, you know what? Um, that was probably the wrong decision. She'd fall apart because girls are much more responsible than boys. So uh, you, you need to know who you're dealing with because you don't want to underreact and let them off the hook, but you don't want to overreact. And, you know, they're already, you know, hating what they did or they're really, you know, disappointed and you pile on. So I would go back to the, the radical candor model. Always care for them personally and let them know unconditionally that you love them and you're, you're there for them, but challenge them directly. And a lot, once again, a lot of people just seem that those are two ends of the spectrum. You can do those together. And the more you care for people, the more you can challenge them, the more they'll respond to your feedback over time. And, uh, you know, you know, someone told me, uh, and, and I, my, my wife is a disciplinarian in our family. And she's like, look, we're not ha here for our kids to be their buddies. We're here to raise them so they can go out into the world and be good adults and work independently and make good decisions. And so we are going to give them some tough love. And uh, it's hard to do it in the moment. You're like, well, what if they run away and never come back? They're not running away. If you love them and you challenge them, they'll be just fine. And they'll come back and thank you later. And we're starting to get that now. Thank you for holding me accountable. Thank you for being a pain. Um, and it's, it was a long time coming, but it'll come back eventually. All right, we are at one o'clock. So I am going to ask one final fun, lighthearted question that came in. Dan, what is your absolute favorite Disney ride in any park in the world? And also I would like to know if you have a favorite Disney character. Very good. So uh, yes, um, Valor and I both love rock and roller coaster at Disney's Hollywood Studios. Aerosmith songs, it blasts rock and roll, great music. You blast out of the station at, I don't know, 60 miles an hour. You go into an immediate loop to loop. You're upside down three or four times. It's a great ride. It's smooth. We love that ride. And Valerie went for her birthday one time and took some friends to Disney. And um, they were held up because the people uh, who were getting in uh, got the ride twice. And she was like, what's going on? And her friend said, well, look at who it is. And it was, it was uh, Steven Tyler actually was there the same day she was for her birthday. And so that was pretty cool. So we have some good memories of that. Um, and my favorite character, we, um, you know, at Disney, the characters are the characters, but sometimes you talk about who you're friends with. And uh, my dad and Valerie and I have all been friends with Tigger at one point or another. And so we really like Tigger. High energy, jumps around. He's a, he's a, he's a pretty good character. So there you go. I love that. I'm also a really big Tigger fan. So that's yeah. a great answer, Dan. Um, so with that, we will wrap up as Dan mentioned, um, he is, has been gracious enough. He has shared some of his presentation materials with me. So I will make sure that that is in the recap email that will be sent tomorrow. Um, Dan, you were awesome. So many insightful nuggets of information that you shared today. I know I personally got a lot out of this presentation and I have no doubt that our guests did as well. Um, thank you again for your time and thank you everyone for joining us today. All right. Thanks everyone. Be safe.